support. <laughs> Awesome. Well, welcome out to yet another week, another day of this awesome sermon series called What Would Jesus Tweet? And before I get into my sermon today, I did want to just be really honest with you guys of something that is a phenomenon on Twitter. It's something that our generation does a lot that is probably not the best thing, but I personally find super entertaining, and that is the idea of Twitter beef. And for those of you who don't know, Twitter beef is basically when people who really should be having a private one-on-one -on -one conversation decide to take their debates or conversations, sometimes they don't even know each other, and they just go at it on social media for all of us to see. It's always super interesting to me to watch people have these conversations that I'm like, this could have been accomplished in a nice phone call, something one-on-one, -on -one, and we get to just read everything that they're saying. So as I was kind of looking through Twitter, I wanted to find a good example of what Twitter beef would look like and I actually came across the most savage account on Twitter and that would be Wendy's. <laughs> yes, Wendy's the fast food restaurant is a complete savage on Twitter and I wanted to share some of these tweets with you today because I just think that they are hilarious but um, I wish I could share them on the screen. I'm just going to read them out to you. So first thing that happened was Chick-fil-A tweeted and they said is there anything better than enjoying one of our spicy chicken sandwiches on a Friday afternoon? And Wendy's replied, yes, enjoying one of ours on a Sunday. Oh. <laughs> and then Tony X tweeted and said, so at Wendy's, are you just going to let IHOB sell burgers on your block? I thought you were the OG. This is when IHOB was trying to sell burgers, I guess. And Wendy's replied, yeah, we're not really afraid of burgers from a place that decided pancakes were too hard. <laughs> and then my last one, which is kind of my favorite, is Butterfingers. Yes, the company Butterfingers decided they were going to tweet Wendy's and they said, hey, come at us if you think that you're so, you're so cool, you're so strong. And Wendy's replied to them and said, sorry for always trading you for something better on Halloween. <laughs> I say all of that to say that there are people in life that are bridge burners and then there are people that are bridge builders. And I would say that Wendy's is a great example of people that were in the business of burning bridges. They didn't really care very much about what people thought of them. They're coming at other fast food restaurants. They probably don't have a really great relationship with the whole fast food community right now. And they didn't care. They didn't want reconciliation. So today, we are going to be talking about what Jesus would tweet, what Jesus would say about the concept of reconciliation. So reconciliation, the dictionary defines it of the restoration of friendly relations. But the Bible goes a little bit further than that. Reconciliation is a huge concept in the Bible. There's a whole passage on the ministry of reconciliation. And there's three different ways that the Bible kind of talks about reconciliation. But it all stems from this Greek word, alasso. And what alasso means is to change, exchange one thing for another, to transform. And so reconciliation can happen in these three ways. It can happen between man and man. So you get in a fight with your brother, you get in a fight with a friend, and you have to reconcile that. You have to start to build that bridge again and mend that relationship. There's also the reconciliation between God and man. The fact that Jesus paid our debt, he set us free, and we are indebted to him, and we are giving our lives back, and we're reconciling what was lost and what we got through Jesus Christ and his sacrifice for us. And then there's financial reconciliation. The Bible talks a lot about finances, but essentially for those of you, I don't know if you deal with your own finances yet or not, but when you're looking at your finances, there is the debt that you owe, bills you need to pay, payments you need to make for school, and then there's the money that you make. And you have to reconcile that. When you're working on your finance, you have to say, okay, here's the money that I made, and here's what I have to pay. And so that's another example of reconciliation. And when I went to prepare for this sermon, I really wanted to focus on the concept of man-to-man -man reconciliation. I've seen a lot of burnt bridges happen in this past year. And I was like, man, I would really love to talk about how we can, from a Christian mindset, reconcile our broken relationships but God kind of reminded me that there's so much more to that word that he has for us in scripture. And we're not going to be able to experience full reconciliation in our man-to-man -man relationships until we fully understand that God 
is constantly reconciling with us. He is the greatest example of reconciliation. And so I didn't want to ignore that either. I'm going to be talking about uh, the passage and the parable out of Matthew 18. So Matthew 18 is from a section of the Bible called the Gospels. And this is essentially an account of Jesus' life on earth. Jesus came. He was born on earth. He had an adult ministry that was flourishing. And he had people that followed him around called the disciples. And they just kind of jotted down all the things they thought were specifically amazing that Jesus did in his ministry on earth. And we get to read about that in Matthew. And so right before Matthew 18 and Matthew 17, I think our friend Pastor Darius shared with us um, that they were talking about how to go through confrontation. Matthew 17 talks about, you know, how we should approach confrontation in a biblical manner, bringing somebody with us, confronting people face to face, things like that. And so in Matthew 18, we land on the parable of the unforgiving debtor. And Peter comes to God and he, he thinks that he's doing something really good. He says to him, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? And when you look at the history of this verse, they say that some rabbi said, yeah, you should forgive them three times. And seven was actually the number of completion. And so I think that Peter was saying, like, Lord, when somebody does me wrong, I'm going to forgive them seven times. That's how loving and gracious I'm going to be. And Jesus' response was awesome. He said, no, 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 not seven times but 70 times seven times you're going to forgive that person. I'm sure Peter was shocked. He's like, oh, I thought I was doing something, but he wasn't. <laughs> uh, so then he goes into, Jesus tells us about the parable of the unforgiving debtor. I'm going to read it to you. It says, therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay this, so his master ordered that he be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owed in order to pay this debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and forgave his debt of millions of dollars. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him just a few thousand dollars and he grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant payment. His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time, be patient with me, I will pay it. Sounds familiar, right? But his creditor would not wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the servants saw this, they were very upset and they went to the king and they told him everything that had happened. And then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servants just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. Jesus said, that's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. And so this is a great example of what God has done for us. God paid an immense amount of debt. Maybe some of you have never even been to church before, and you're, you're coming in today, and you're carrying weight. You're carrying shame. You say, you know what? I've done a mess of things. I shouldn't even be here right now. But you are. And listen, God is in the business of reconciling your debt, reconciling with your sin. He wants to work through it with you, and he wants you to leave this place free. And those of us who do attend church weekly, we get to every week repent and be forgiven of our sin and walk out of this place free. However, when people wrong us, we're so quick to be angry. We're so quick to want to hold grudges. Yeah. People post things on social media that rub us the wrong way that we think that's so insensitive. We get angry. We don't want to reconcile with people like that. They're never going to change. That's not what Jesus does for us every single day. God exemplifies reconciliation with us. So how can we exemplify reconciliation with others? So let's get practical here. I want to talk about three ways that we can reconcile with others. The first thing that I noticed out of this parable that Jesus told was it's important to know someone's story. 
In verse 25, the king, after ordering that this man be sold because he owed these millions of dollars, he said, let him be sold along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned. So he knew a little bit of something about this man. He knew that he had kids. He knew that he had a wife. So this king knew this servant. It's important that before we jump to conclusions about someone that we get to know who they are, the why behind the what. Rather than just addressing how much we hate the behavior, maybe we should take a step back and learn a little bit more about how that behavior started. And then we can show mercy on them. When we have friends that do something wrong, we can easily be like, man, yeah, you're going through it right now. I understand why you made that mistake. But if someone that we don't know does something or posts something that we just think is ridiculous, we're like, how could you ever, right? Know their story. Next thing is, number two, see their potential. It says in verse 26 and 27, right after he orders that this man be sold, the man fell down before his master, begged him, please be patient with me. I will pay it all. And it says that the master was filled with pity for him. So not only does the master and this king know his story, but he sees his potential. He sees, okay, well, this man, you know, he's owed me so much. He wants to work to repay it. I don't know what this king's process was at the time, but obviously he was filled with some sort of remorse and pity for this man and saw a potential in him that he wanted to set him free and give him another chance. And Jesus sees that potential in us. He sees, you know, he knows our story. He knows us well. He says, hey, I want to give you another chance. I know that you have space to grow, so go do it. And we have to do that in other people as well. And lastly, number three is we have to forgive, we have to establish boundaries. I put these two together because I thought it was important. It was an interesting conversation with my friend Mandy yesterday and we talked about forgiveness and how we can easily talk about forgiveness often as a church. Even in this parable, we could look at this and be like, God, forgive us so much. You have to forgive everyone in your life all of the time. And you do. You do. But I also want to recognize that some of you may have left toxic situations that have marked you. And maybe even if you've never been to church before, you're thinking about situations where you're like, I can never forgive that person because they hurt me physically, mentally, emotionally. Listen, just because we're called to forgive doesn't mean that we can't establish healthy boundaries in the relationships with the people that we had to forgive. Mm -hmm. I'm not asking you to forgive someone and walk right back into a life of spending every moment with them and telling them all about your life. There are some people that my mom always said, you have to love it at arm's length. But you have to love really, truly within your heart. Let's not just say that we're going to love someone, pray for someone, but not really mean it. And forgiveness helps us with that. Forgiveness helps us to love people the way Jesus would again. Forgiveness doesn't mean that you have to tell that person even that you forgave them. It can be an internal experience that you have between you and the Lord. And you can protect yourself. We're not here to be doormats, right? You guys deserve to be treated with love and respect. But you can still walk in forgiveness mm -hmm. and decide how far you want to go with the person who has hurt you because canceling people should not be an option for the church. Okay. No matter what side they err on, no matter the opinions that they have, the things that they've said to you, nobody deserves to get canceled because Jesus would never cancel you. And even if you're coming to church for the first time, I just want to reiterate, Jesus doesn't want to look past you. He doesn't want to cancel you. He wants to welcome you into this. So before I conclude, I do just want to say there's two ways that we can respond to this message. Maybe in this message you're thinking a lot about people that you haven't talked to in years, people that you just thought this relationship could never be reconciled. You have the opportunity to do that because Jesus has fought to reconcile you, a sinner, and brought you into freedom. But you can't experience that until you experience that reconciliation with Jesus first. Yeah. Until you reconcile yourself with God first. And we're going to have the opportunity to do that today. And it's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So in conclusion, what would Jesus tweet? What would Jesus tweet about reconciliation? I believe that if Jesus had anything to say about reconciliation, it would look a little bit like Ephesians 4 verses 31 through 32, where Paul writes, get rid of all bitterness, rage, and anger, brawling and slander, along with every form of malice. 
be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ, God forgave you. And I just pray right now that you hold on to that verse, that you use that verse and apply it to yourself, that you can be forgiven, and apply it to others. They have that same access, and they should have that same access to reconciliation and forgiveness with you. So let's bow our heads and pray. Jesus, I just thank you so much for who you are, God. I thank you that you are in the business of reconciliation at all times. And God, if there's anyone in this room right now who has never reconciled their sin and their shame and their guilt with you, God, I just pray that they can open their hearts to experience you fully. And if that is you, would you ask God to come into your life and begin that process of reconciliation with you? Jesus, would you do a new thing in them? And God, for those of us who have reconciled with you, but we haven't reconciled with others, and we've chosen cancel culture, we've chosen the easy way out, would you just do a work in us, God? Would you intervene and set up conversations that bring healing, that bring prosperity, that bring love and kindness? Because that is, that is who you are, God. Thank you so much for this day. I pray that you bless these people. In your name, amen. Amen. amen.